Hi dear students, welcome to Life Excellence IAS Academy. So today we are going to discuss the articles of 10th September 2020. The first article that we are going to discuss is this a very prominent article in the context of COVID-19 that is digital disconnect. So what are we trying to understand in this article is because of poor access to the internet in many of the states it's having a huge impact on education especially the students are facing the brunt of this digital divide. So why are we discussing this it's because NSO has given a report that a survey of household social consumption on education in India. See this report was for 2017 and 18. First of all before we proceed we need to understand what is this digital divide or digital disconnect we are speaking about then we should also understand what are the highlights of this article moving further let's come back to this article and understand what are the suggestions or what are the way we can overcome this digital divide so what is this digital divide see it means to say that there is something which is called as uneven distribution with respect to the ICT technology uneven distribution can be in terms of access to the internet and ICT services or usage with respect to the usage see for example we may have internet but we may not have a tools for using the internet and finally the impact of this digital divide so what is this it is it is uneven distribution is across the geographical boundaries it may be urban areas rural area or north indian states south indian states like that or it may be across the social sectors it may be across the economic classes rich and the poor or among the gender so what are we trying to tell over here is this that digital divide is the uneven distribution with respect to the access and usage of internet it may be across the geographical borders or a social or the gender disparity so let's see the highlight of the report that has been given by the uh, nso survey moving further this image gives you a complete picture of the regional disparity that is existing with respect to the internet divide okay so you can see here this is the percentage of population who can able to use the computer and this is a percentage of population which are able to use the internet moving further you can see the households that own computer over here all over india only 10.7% have access to the computer among them again the divide between the urban and rural area you can see very clearly that 23% of the urban areas have computers whereas rural area only 4.4% then with respect to internet facility so households that have internet like all over india the average is 23.8% and urban it is 42% and 14.9% among the rural areas so now you are able to understand the difference between urban and the rural areas so moving further you can see with respect to the internet usage also the pink indicates women the yellow is the total one and the m is i mean the blue one is the male so you can see here with respect to the usage of internet so highest internet has been is being used by the men that is 43.5% in the urban areas and 17.1% in the rural areas so you can observe the highest gender gap over here only 30% of female are using the internet in urban areas and 8.7% of the rural women so with this we can see over here what is the gender gap with respect to the internet access and with respect to the tools for accessing the internet we have also seen the uh, difference between urban as well as the rural areas so coming to this article you can also see over here that delhi himachal pradesh kerala they have internet access exceeding 50% whereas larger states like uttar pradesh tamil nadu andhra pradesh karnataka have access less than 20% moving further some rural states like uh, odisha madhya pradesh telangana karnataka west bengal they have only 5 to 10% of internet connectivity see this is all about internet connectivity apart from internet connectivity we also have power fluctuations we also have reliability problem of internet so this is the current state of internet when we know net access is very critical and many of the state governments also are sponsoring government schemes of issuing the laptops and mobile connectivity devices for the students to improve their education and learning outcomes but at the same time we are not able to provide them access to basic internet services so in this context we could remember the words of prime minister modi which was said with respect to the independence day address that all the villages will be connected with optical fiber cable in 1000 days so that's where the 2011 also we have initiated linking all the panchayats with national optical fiber network but however we despite taking initiatives like unnati 
ई पाठशाल कॉमन सर्विस सेंटर्स नैशनल ऑप्टिकल फाइबर नेटवर्क एंड टेक्नोलॉजी एक्ट एवरी थिंग वी आर नॉट एबल टू ब्रिज दिस डिजिटल डिवाइड सो एक्सपेशली विद कोविड सुनारियो वी हैव एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड द इम्पॉर्टेंस एंड द नीड और नेसेसिटी ऑफ द इंटरनेट इन दिस कंटेक्स वॉट इज ऑथर इज ट्राइंग टू सजेस्ट इज द गवर्नमेंट बेस्ड ऑन द एन एस एस वो डेटा हैज टू स्टार्ट mapping of those district which needs internet at the top priority then they shall also take the help of these telecom companies because they have the capacity for making this surveys and mapping so what are we trying to say first of all identify the gaps second thing we want to give the tools for accessing the internet so in such a case we can use this the refurbished laptops that can be donated to the students moving further the third thing how do we provide the internet services in accessible areas so then we can use this wireless fiber technology that is used by the developed countries so even though it's very promising but the cost is too high so government has to look for all the possibilities so that they will be able to bridge this digital divide so understand the importance of this article this article is coming in the picture of the survey given by nso understand what is digital divide understand what is the digital divide across different sectors then understand among the different geographical areas having understood that then understand the initiatives that government has started with respect to it then finally author is trying to conclude that identify areas of disparity or disconnect then find out the tools with which we can bridge the disconnectivity then the last but not the least providing the act accessible internet to all of them by finding out the viable alternatives that is available to bridge the disparity let's move on to the next article the twisted trajectory of bt cotton despite finding huge favor in india the gm crop has brought only modest benefits see all of us were assuming that bt cotton is a boon to india because of which india is standing as the highest exporter of cotton varieties but the true fact is this as per the report of published in the nature plans the benefits that we have acquired because of bt cotton is only modest and short lived so this is what is this article is trying to say let's try to understand the timeline of bt cotton adoption and what is the current crisis that we are undergoing see cotton is something which we are using from thousands of years you can see cotton fabric is used around 300 3000 bc also and the first excavation was done in manjadaro the archaeological findings in meghar pakistan so moving further we were also exporting at that point of time to various other countries then whatever cultivation we were doing this 20th century is these desi varieties of crops they were not resistant to the pest so because of they were not resistant we were supposed to use this fertilizers pesticides all these things so that we can save our crop but however despite use of this synthetic uh, or man made pesticides there was not much benefit we were not able to control the pest and at the same time it led to the emergence of resistant pests like american ball worm pink worm all these things came to the picture so to control these pests again they started using more and more pesticides so they use more and more pesticides automatically the investments whatever we are making on this will increase so with increase in this thing the resistance also started increasing among the pest so this worsened the conditions of the cotton growers so that's where finally in 2002 we introduced bt cotton so why did we introduce bt cotton bt cotton is a genetically modified cotton with bacillus thuringiensis so the intention of this bt cotton is to reduce the burden on the farmers so that they can save their money they can save their crop they can save their soil also so what they started doing they started adopting more and more bt cotton so with this they wanted to reduce the cost that they are investing on pesticides because bt cotton was pest resistant then along with that it can also increase the yield was the promise so earlier in the earlier decades we could find out that with usage of bt cotton the yields almost increased by thrice or the yield almost tripled but with the recent reports published in the nature plans this is not true so what they are trying to say is that there was some kind of bias or whatever the statistics that is given with bt cotton and yield increase was dubious of nature there are so many discrepancies between yield and deployment of the bt cotton so they have given try to given you some examples wherein in the case of maharashtra or in the case of punjab haryana rajasthan the yield increase is not necessarily because of bt cotton it's also because increase in the fertilization it's also because of increase in the irrigation facilities so you cannot attribute the yield increase only to a particular factor is what they are trying to say in this article even though 
ABW category has not developed pest resistance, but PW has res PBW has developed the resistance to this uh, BT cotton. Because of this, you can see there is increase in the pink ball worm across the cotton cultivation, and with this again. The people are spending more on the insecticides and pesticides to control this. So, what is the ultimate use of having a BT cotton which is pest resistant? Okay, you can see the amount of expenditure that is being spent by the people for insecticides, and we can also see that despite having growing this BT cotton at a broader level, India still stands at the rank 36th among the countries of producing the cotton. So, along with BT cotton, we are also using heavy fertilizers, irrigations, chemicals, etc., to increase the yield, but still it's not that promising so what are we trying to conclude is this the usage of bt cotton and the benefits thrived out of it is only short-lived and the modest of nature so the viable alternative that is available is going for the desi varieties of cotton with pure uh, line and high density planting we can have a better chance of faring well with respect to the cotton productions so having understood the significance of bt cotton and its misadventures we shall not experiment the same with respect to bt brinjal or the herbicide resistance so just try to understand and remember this particular article it's important because we always predicted that bt cotton was the most promising with respect to yield but with the recent publication we can say that bt cotton is not as promising as expected Let's move to the next article. In blockchain outing, leave out the general election. See, what are we trying to discuss in this article is this. So, we are trying to digitize the India's electronic infrastructure. But at the same time, we have to ensure that it will not affect our idea of free and fair elections. So, what are we trying to discuss over here is with respect to the recent conference that was held by Election Commission of India with respect to digitization of electoral infrastructure along with Tamil Nadu government and IIT Madras. In this, they are trying to propose usage of blockchain technology for ensuring voting from the remote locations. As you are all well aware, blockchain technology is no nothing but a distributed ledger of information that will be connected to a peer-to-peer -peer network mode and you are also well aware that blockchain technology say we can keep the data very safe so that's where it may be bitcoin or it may be ethereum like cryptocurrencies are based on the blockchain technology now this blockchain technology is being used beyond the bitcoins and cryptocurrencies towards ensuring a smart contract to ensure the supply chain management and also enabling the orders from the remote location so what are the positivities that we have if at all we go for a remote voting the first thing is this it will benefit the internal migrant and seasonal workers too. In India, we have almost 51 million population who are been working as a migrants or as a seasonal workers. So this will ensure that they will also take part in the process of democracy. The second thing is this. And the second category of people that is our soldiers who are working in the remotest location like Siachen Glacier will also be able to access the voting. So even though we have advantage but the disadvantages outweigh the advantage. So we can see what are the disadvantages that we literally go with this. By using this system, the electors are supposed to come to one physical location. So in that physical location, we will be having these high P devices which are dedicatedly connected to an internet lines. And they're also using the biometric attributes to ensure authenticity of the orders. If we have to successfully use blockchain technology as a solution, then the most important thing is we have to properly implement the cryptographic protocols. Somewhere, a small hiccups with respect to implementation will cost huge with respect to blockchain technology. So you can see the example of the Russian case. So in recently in Russia, there was a public voting with respect to the constitutional amendment that was initiated by Vladimir Putin. So when citizens were voting online by using a blockchain technology, the Russian media has brought into the picture that the odds cast by the people were able to access and decrypt. With this, the whole trust what people had over the systems of elections, they lost. And with respect to the voting system, they lost. So this shows the other side of the or the dark face of the technologies. Moving further, we are saying with this biometric authentication, so there will not be any problem. But however, as you are well aware, biometric attributes could be cloned. By cloning the biometric attributes, they can access as an other individual and they can cast vote on behalf of them so we cannot say biometric attributes or authenticity 
is not vulnerable to the attacks and the second thing the physical implants or softwares they can be accessed or some attack can be made on them by attacking on them we can obtain the information and that information can modify or it can affect the individual choices with respect to the voting they can be it can be like something like a post truth giving a mixed information to the people then moving further we are also trying to say there will be a dedicated line so that it is free of all the attacks but as you are all aware dos attacks can also be made on this dedicated this systems so these are the challenges that we have to face if at all we are using a blockchain voting so what is it at this cost what is the idea of us so the very idea is we want to have a ballot portability that is we want maximum people to participate in the voting procedure so now what is the other available alternatives if india has to go for we have postal ballots we have proxy voting or the one more policy possibility of one nation one voter id card can also be prepared with these points we can definitely ensure ballot portability but india is not so india is always obsessed with the techno solutionism that is we want a solution through the technology we are over obsessed with respect to that and we believe that whatever we do with technology will always give a right results so what we have to understand with respect to free and fair elections is that digitization in itself is not a solution instead we should also ensure that other ways how we can bring in efficiency with respect to the voting patterns inclusiveness in the election system despite all these challenges if election commission of india could address all the problem and find out the the best techno solution then in such a case also the system should be used only for the elections at the lower level rather than to the higher level because a small hiccups can spoil or it can be a dark spot in our democracy moving on to the next article redefining a farmer so here we want to define farmer farmer is not the only person who owns owns a land or who possesses a land okay farmer is also a person who is deriving his income from agriculture so we want to def broaden the definition of agriculture that is the whole context of this article so other other reason why this is required is because as you are well aware there is a scam that has happened with respect to prime minister kisan yojana as you are well aware in tamil nadu 110 crore scam has happened despite though there were eligible beneficiaries because of brokers and other people real beneficiaries did not get any benefit out of pm kisan so now why do you think the redefining of farmer is very important because as you are well aware as soon as the covid got over the first sector which got a major push is agriculture sector so government has launched a slew of measures as you can see over here that is investments in the agri infrastructure logistics capacity building administrative reforms and direct benefit transfer under the kisan yojana boosting of credit through kcc all these are done in order to empower the farmers but at the same time what is happening is this we are trying to empower the farmers who are owning the land but as you are well aware in india we have so many farmers who are working or who are working as a land tenants okay whatever is the yojanas or programs that we are launching all these benefits have been taken up by the owners of the land rather than the tenants or the leases who are working over the land so you can see over here either it may be the subsidies the rent or the loan waivers or the moratoriums institutional credit all these benefits are going only to the land owners rather than the land leasers because even though we have brought in this model agriculture land leasing all these things but this land leasing has not been formalized and systematized in india so despite various initiatives taken up by the government it is really not reaching the targeted beneficiaries because of this definition of the farmer so that's where so 59th uh, round of sas sam situation assessment survey has given a different definition of the farmers that is the one who is owning the land however the 70th round of definition is said to be the most broad definition because you are trying to dealing the land as a criteria for recognizing as a farmers along with that they are also telling those 
those households who are en- engaged in the agriculture as their part of income so that is at least if they are getting 3000 rupees out of the agriculture income then they can be called as a farmers so moving further even the national policy of farmers have also given a broad based definition see unless and un- until in india we go for land to the tillers so the things cannot be solved or the problems in the agriculture sector cannot be solved so therefore the best solution is having a broader definition of farmers so that at least for a short term we can ensure inclusive and sustainable development and the growth of the far- agriculture sector so remember here what are we trying to say is we want to have a broad based definition of the farmer so that whatever is the benefits that government is trying to give it goes to the tenants who are actually working on the land rather than to the owners and the money lenders Let's move on to the next article. One in three high schoolers gets private coaching. See, why are we reading this particular article? It's because 75th round of national sample survey report was released. In this report, particularly, they were trying to make a survey and find out what is the consumption expenditure on education. So here... In this video, we have also studied about digital disconnect. That article also we were referring about this 75th round of sample survey. So what we have to understand in this article is very critical and important. So first of all, 19.8% of the students from pre-preliminary to graduate students take some kind of a private coaching. And especially one out of the five students in the school, uh, school level take up the private coaching and at the secondary level one in three will be taking the private coaching and if you see some of the states in the especially in the eastern states they spend more on private coaching compared to the regular schooling the best example would be west bengal so what are we trying to say out of this article or what are the conclusions that we want to draw first of all we are not emphasizing on the quality education at the regular schooling so that's where to supplement that efforts we are going for a coaching institute second thing out of the pocket consumption expenditure on education is increasing because of the private expenditure that we are making thirdly it's trying to create some kind of a education disparity because only the people who are rich they are able to afford it and the people in the urban areas are able to afford compared to the rural area it's kind of a divide that is happening in the education. education sector let's move on to the next article government will ease problems of the poor prime minister so here this article is of not much importance to us but what is important is this fund so prime minister street vendors atmanirbhar nidhi it is prime minister savnat so this is a scheme launched by prime minister to kick start the business of the street vendors as you know because of the covid impact their business was almost shattered so now with this micro credit scheme they want to restart their business and this is implemented under ministry of urban affairs let's see the highlights of the program so first of all they are giving a loan without collateral there is no guarantee that is to be paid and the loan will be for 10000 rupees so this 10000 rupees has to be paid within one year with a monthly installments and this loan for the first time can be given by micro financial institutions non banking financial companies self help group etc and the most important thing is for the first time this loan will can also be given to the rural areas also see this program is launched for urban poor, uh, urban poor but still rural people can also obtain the benefits from this program this scheme will be valid till march 2022 apart from loan they also provide interest subsidy on this program so on the early repayment of the loan 7% of the interest rates will be subsidized and the third thing is that so now they are only providing 10k of the loan further if they are paying loans properly then this credit limits will also be increased to 20k moving further they are also trying to promote digital transactions by the street vendors then ministry is also getting collaborated with ict department to bring in awareness among the street vendors for utilization of these services see whenever it comes to the scheme what do you have to do so first of all see what is the name of the scheme if there is any hindi names then try to find out the english alternative of it then who is the implementing ministry or who is the ministry that is launching then try to find out the highlights of the scheme then particularly beneficiary and if there is any cost sharing component find out that also so this is how you need to read every scheme 
The next article, Indo-Pacific Trilateral Dialogue held. So what is this trilateral dialogue? It is between India, Australia and the France. So the, in this dialogue, it is a first dialogue which has happened with respect to Indo-Pacific. They've discussed about the economic challenges because of COVID-19 and the geostrategic challenges. So after discussing this, so they are trying to have cooperation with respect to the maritime security and the global commons. What is this global commons? It's with respect to the thing which is common for the world as a whole. That is climate, environment biodiversity health etc intention is to promote the global good so this is the first trilateral held so that's where it's pretty important just try to remember a trilateral dialogue that was held between in indo-pacific region that was between india australia and france Moving to the next article, defense exports increased 700% in three years, as said by Chief of Defense Staff. So what are we trying to understand in this article is this. So we have a growth of defense to 10,745 crore in last three years. Why is this there is increase in the exports? It's because government has taken many measures from 2014 for boosting the exports. The first thing among them is they have given liberalized industrial licensing for defense. Second thing, they have relaxed the norms for export control thirdly the number of objection certificates has been increased fourthly the indian external affairs minister is also trying to give line of credit to the countries who are importing defense from us and credit through exim bank is also promoted for them Fifthly, the defense attachment, I mean, whenever we have our machines in the foreign countries, we're also promoting the defense attaches to them so, they, so that we can promote more and more defense exports to those countries. So now, as you all are well aware, India is the third largest country to spend on defense. So now, as per the Rawat, we want to change the distribution of our budget. We have to make it more realistic so that India from being only a net importer, we can also be a global supply chain with respect to the defense. In that regard, India has recently issued policy that is defense production and export promotion policy can be a milestone. Let's move on to the next article, Bold Action Needed to Revive Economy. So recently there was a FIKI meeting and this what they have told us this, because of the low demand, low income cycle, it is very difficult for us to come back to the positive growth trajectory. In this regard, what are they trying to tell? Weak demand, especially 68% of industries are complaining that because of weak demand, the economy is not reviving. In such a scenario, government should go for a massive fiscal push. So what is the kind of fiscal push that the government they are expecting? It is additional transfer of funds to the migrant workers, poor and the farmers. Then temporary cut in the GST that is being collected. Fourth one, government should go for public procurement, more and more of public procurement. Then front-end infrastructure promoting should be done. Finally, they should be increasing the wages of the people. So with that, we can also make employment to be sustainable. When the employment is sustainable, the spending will increase. As the spending will increase, automatically the demand will increase. And when the demand increases, investments and the production will increase. Thereby, economy will come back to the normal growth trajectory. Let's move on to the next article. In instead of an article, it's a series of articles. So the one from the editorial is this realism and anti-marketed border here what the author is trying to say is whatever is a conflict that is happening between india and china is not because of the modern day territorial expansion it's basically because of the past it's because our borders were not clearly demarcated in the past the second article is with respect to the rethinking of defense doctrine here the author is trying to suggest that instead of going for a punitive uh, retaliation that is once when someone occupies your territory try and go go and try to protect the territory instead of that let's prevent such kind of attacks on our territory let's ensure there is a proper defense strategy with us so where we, de we defend our territory and we ensure that no attacker will come and occupy our territory so there's a shift that is necessary from punitive retaliation to preventive retaliation so moving further the next article is about massive chinese buildup on the north bank of pangong lake so as you are all well aware so now the pangong lake has become a major bone of contention between both of us See, on a one day you have three articles with respect to this so this as issue is going on from last three months so almost can you expect around 60 to 70 articles which has come only about india and china so what i'm trying to tell you is whenever these kind of issues which come keeps on coming in a daily newspaper on a daily basis try to ignore them instead understand what are the major conflicts for example like india and china so when it comes to india and china just understand what is the relationship between india and china with respect to the 
economy with respect to polity with respect to geostrategy all these things so then surrounding that then understand what is a major issues that india and china is facing it may be with respect to the trade deficit it may be with respect to dumping it may be with respect to the border conflict that we are currently facing then what are the ways of overcoming it so whenever you consider this as an issue then only you will be able to understand and write a proper answer in the examination so with respect to india china conflict and all the challenges we would make a separate video so that you will get altogether a complete picture with respect to the relationship